What's up everyone, David here. Welcome to my channel. If you are new, welcome back. If you are not, good to see you as always. And today we're talking about key interpersonal communication skills for you to have success and the happiness that you want in life, whether that's at work, career, business, relationships, romantic, platonic. These are things that are meta skills. They underlie all kinds of other skills in our life in order to help us be successful. There's something I've worked on a lot and have helped coach people a lot around. Let's start off with the first skill. The first skill is plain and simple verbal communication. Verbal communication. Now, when we say verbal, we mean mainly talking. I will add as a subset, of course, the typed or written communication. But there's so much that's conveyed through verbal communication when we're actually talking in person, over a Zoom call, a phone call, what have you. And it's a different form to be able to communicate in hopefully the same way when we're talking about text, email, anything like that. Within verbal, we could have tone of voice, um, we could have cadence at how quickly you're speaking or how slowly you're talking, or if you're making to emphasize a point, using a pause like I just did, right? There's all kinds of factors. You know, we could break down verbal communication into things like asking questions, making statements, storytelling, your word choice, how you're saying what you're saying to get your communication across. A lot of times people are really interested in storytelling which all in all, you don't have to be a great storyteller, but you gotta be able to tell a story to a certain degree. I mean, amazing great storytellers are, are really cool to be around and listen to and very engaging. But sometimes I get clients coming to me, they go, I really, really need to become a master storyteller. I'm like, mm, no you don't. You just need to get better at it. And it's surprising, I was working with a client recently where they really thought they weren't that good of a storyteller, but he busted out some stories very quickly. I was like, wow, you're much better than you led me on to believe. And I know that you can get nervous and tense and shy and that really shuts down your ability to communicate, including storytell. But look at how natural it is. Typically, you know, we are kind of natural storytellers. Verbal communication obviously is super important and something to work on. Next is active listening, active listening. So we often think that we're listening when we're not. Active listening really means this. It means to listen to somebody, understand what they're saying from their viewpoint. That's really deep active listening. I think there's a level, a couple levels here at least where, yeah, we can just listen to understand the facts they're saying, and there's a level for that, but let's say somebody's really trying to communicate something that's important to them or they're struggling with, that deeper level of listening, and people can feel it when you're really listening to them. That's something I learned as a coach, that's a, a huge skill set we train on, that also leads to me in life when I meet new people, they just sort of open up to me because of the way I listen and I don't even know I'm doing it. People might say, oh my gosh, I feel like I've known you for so long or I feel so comfortable around you. That is because I worked on the skill of active listening. Asking questions does tie into that. The two really go hand in hand because you can ask questions one off, you know, here and there and just sort of throw away questions and not really listen. That happens a lot. There are people that maybe they're so engaged up in their head, in their thinking that they're sort of trying to have a conversation and listen, but they just haven't practiced it enough or know how to like relax their thinking and, and zone in and focus in on what they're saying, right? Anytime you're a coach or a counselor in sales, it's a huge skill set that is utilized in leadership. Management positions for leaders are actually good. Just because somebody's in higher management doesn't mean that they're actually good. So again, important is when you're listening to somebody is to really kind of tune in and go, and really try to listen into deeper what they might be saying and really put your presence and your focus on them and take the attention off you and really listen to them. And so next up we have empathy slash emotional intelligence. This is similar to active listening, but still different, right? It, it sort of blends naturally with it. But empathy is really trying to get a sense of how that person is feeling what's going on with them emotionally and get into the world that way. It's another energetic thing that people can feel when you have empathy. It's like trying to get into their world, but not also really, we don't want to take on their emotions necessarily, but we're relating to, oh, I felt that way before. And just by accessing that, I am being empathetic to somebody. And I'm not just sort of moving along in the conversation really quickly. I'm not just trying to move it along and only deal with the factual or intellectual part of the conversation. Sorry, B, B coming at me, but I was empathetic and the B flew away. Um, where was I? So yes, so being empathetic is really that, that a sense that there's an emotional connection going on. And now that also means having an intelligence and paying attention to different types of emotions, right? And maybe even studying up and understanding those in some way. 
because we've got happiness, we've got joy, which is a different form of happiness, we've got sadness, we've got fear, we've got excitement, we've got anxiousness, you know, kind of positive and negative versions of these emotions and all the flavors. And by the way, if you like it all what you're seeing here, please subscribe. It'll make sure that you get the latest videos and hit that notification bell as well so you know right when videos come out. Also smash the like button. It helps the algorithm know that this is good stuff and spread the word out to more people like you who want to see this kind of content. Next up, we have body language, body language. Uh, this is your disposition in your body. This is how open or closed you are. It might be how fast or slow your movements are. It might be kind of the energy that you carry with you that people can kind of sense even beyond the physical a little bit. I would throw it in there. I sometimes talk about vibe. I didn't put it in this list, but vibe is really tied to this, right? Um, so for instance, I'm sitting here, I'm kind of in this relaxed chair. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with my lower back with the way I'm position to fit into the camera, <laughs> to be honest. But I'm generally pretty open and relaxed. I'm using my hands to talk, right, express points. Now, it would be very different if I was sitting here talking like this. Now, what's really interesting is as I do this, I, I felt my voice change. It felt more contained and closed in and not as open and expressive, right? I just naturally do that. Now, I'm gonna try to talk again, you know, more expressively and all that, and I can already feel that my arms wanna move, that this expression wants to go and move naturally. Now. It doesn't mean that being more expressive and open is always better. Let's say you're in, you know, somebody's weirding you out and you kind of are closing your body language off. Maybe you want to communicate that. <laughs> Maybe you're feeling uncomfortable and that's a good signal to send. It doesn't mean, oh, this is always bad, but, but a lot of times more open body language really, really matters. And I'm just going to float into the next point, which is openness, right? Being open and being kind of relaxed in connection to that makes others feel at ease. It's a combination of you know, mental, emotional, and physical comfortableness or comfortable enough. It's something I've worked on a lot and a lot of clients come to me for. Just reopening my list here because I uh, lost it. Openness is actually huge and people can, you know, this also can be communicated through your verbiage, right? If you're asking questions and curious, that can show openness, right? Of course, how you ask it, that you ask it in an open way. But this is something I work on with clients a lot, um, especially when they're meeting new people, let's say, and they're working on a shyness issue, is to really attempt to be open to others and open to conversations. And sometimes that means starting a conversation, even if it's uncomfortable, you know, at first, it tends to get easier over time through exposure. But yeah, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but it shows that you are open to people by going and starting that conversation. Not only that, but if you're starting conversation with somebody, the whole room starts to notice. That's just how it works. So openness, obviously huge key skill. All right, next up is persuasive abilities, persuasive abilities. This has to do with understanding how to invite people, how to offer things to people in ways that are compelling to them. Now, if you've ever watched those old mafia movies, they'll be like, yeah, you know, I'll do the old baseball bat persuasion. Not really talking about that, though technically that's a form of persuasion. Um, we're talking about things that are more invitational, right? Make people want to come to your party, come to your event, come to work for you, or come to work at the company you're working at if they're somebody you like and they're deciding they want to switch jobs. Something like this, right? Power of invitation is huge. Not only that, like when it comes to invitation, which is a subset of persuasion skills, it is something that people remember, even if they say no. This is something I really teach clients a lot, have to work with them. They're like, well, what if people reject me and don't want to come? Well, that's okay. They're going to start to see you as somebody who's more social, who's more open, who is engaged with people, who is up to things in life by inviting them along. That's a leadership trait and persuasion is a huge part of leadership. It's not manipulation in that sense of, okay, I'm going to try to do this and just get my way every time and yeah, I'll show them and put one over on them. It's not that. Persuasion is a very positive characteristic actually. So learning how to do this, as an example, if I'm going to invite somebody to a party and I'm like, hey, you know, what are you up to Saturday night? Uh, uh actually, I don't really have any plans. Well, hey, if you'd like to, going to a party, just having a few people, having a get together, have the grill going, you know, just ask you to bring a drink, something you like to drink if you like, going to provide the food and it should be a really cool time, you know, small group, five, ten of us, tops, you should come, right? That's pretty invitational invitation versus, hey, I've got this party on Friday night. You should come. See the difference? I'm sort of 
I started with a question, and I'm not saying you always have to start with a question, like, hey, what are you up to? I'm sort of taking my time with it. And I'm also sort of reading them and gauging where they're at, you know, watching their body language and their vibe. They might say, actually, I've, I've got plans on Saturday. Be like, oh, well, that's great. That's cool. You know, I am having this party if you'd like to stop by, if you have some time. Um, so then I'm also going to shift my invitation versus if I just go in one shot and go, hey, I've got this party Friday night. You should come. It's not too skillful, right? <laughs> not really paying attention to their situation. Notice how I'm using a lot of what I've talked about already. I'm using listening, I'm using my verbal communication skills, I'm using empathy, emotional intelligence, part of persuasive abilities, obviously. So obviously there's a crossover between all these interpersonal communication skills I'm talking about. Focusing on persuasion is a huge, huge important thing, I feel. Next up is assertiveness. Uh, that's more like aggressiveness a little bit now, but assertiveness is really is really huge It's that driving energy that moves things forward in life, right? Assertiveness is not something I've ever been short on You know in certain situations I wasn't like with when I had social anxiety and shyness running me all the time I had a natural assertiveness for focusing and getting things done But I had to work on being more assertive and translating that into being more assertive with people And that's what a lot of a lot of people come to this channel for and coaching etc And but you know assertiveness is that willingness to sort of step forward and drive things forward a lot of times this can come in the form of language that drives things forward like hey I need you to do this like request or can you do this for me I'm going here um, you decide if you want to come or not but I'm going you know <laughs> sometimes it does mean to be a little forceful we don't want to be aggressive with it um, assertiveness can be walking over and starting the conversation it can be okay I'm drumming up my courage here because I haven't gotten a raise in two years and I need to go have that conversation with my boss my manager because it's really not fair instead of just being more passive and going, okay, well, I hope they are going to raise, you know, give me a raise or a promotion or something while you're stewing in resentment and getting pissed off and want to quit, right? When it should have been a conversation of, hey, I'd like to talk to you. I've been here for two years and early on I was promised to raise and that hasn't happened, let alone there hasn't been any talk of it. Can we have a discussion about that and, and what's my future here? Uncomfortable to have that conversation a lot of times. Negotiation skills can kind of tie into this and persuasiveness actually. And being assertive and being being able to have that conversation also being able to walk away and move on and own and know your value and go work somewhere else in the work example. If it's a relationship where things aren't going well from your end and maybe they're sort of oblivious to it or a denial of it, guys are often blamed for this. <laughs> because we can do it traditionally. Either way, a partner is going to say, hey, I'd like to talk to you. I'm just feeling like we're not communicating. We're not really spending time with each other. We're not like present with each other. And I just want to see what's going on between us, right? That takes assertiveness. Assertiveness is being uncomfortable. Assertiveness is when you're going to go into that parking space and you see that other person going for it, but you're ahead and you're not being a jerk, but you just go for it and get in there because you were first. Now, I'm not saying in every in every case, you should be assertive. I'm not saying assertive all the time. That's that's being like a bull in a china shop and using a screwdriver for everything or a hammer for everything, right? Each of these skills are like that. You don't want to be too open all the time, right? Because actually openness and assertiveness are opposing energies. This was in my personal development slash coaching training years ago where I learned that openness and assertiveness are on the opposite sides of an energetic kind of quad. If I, my body is open, I can't make my body be like this and kind of pointed forward. Even physically, right, if I'm talking about asserting myself, like in a martial arts fight, when I'm going in and committing, it's a directed energy, it's assertive energy versus open when I'm kind of waiting, hanging back, see what they're doing. I'm still poised and I'm aware, but it's a very different energy. And both energies are really important to have. Next up is conflict resolution. To me, this is a smaller part of persuasive abilities because this is a really interesting one. I'm not going to say I'm the best at this. I deal with conflict when I need to, but I will avoid conflict for sure at times. I'm kind of in between. There are people that are really, really assertive about conflict resolution. They almost charge into it. And this ties into assertiveness, what I just talked about, because there's a conflict going on, right? Maybe the employer doesn't know it in my last example or a partner in a relationship, but you're feeling it. There's a conflict. Or maybe they're coming to you with something going, hey, so-and-so said that you did didn't do XYZ task, oh, you let the invoices drop, TPS reports from office space weren't done, and they're saying that you were supposed to do them. What's going on with this? Boom, conflict. How do you handle that? How do you deal with that? Super important to know how to do that. Not for the topic of this video. There are droves and droves of information to read up on that. But conflict resolution is something that I personally should work on better. Although when it comes down to it, I will do it. I deal with it. I just feel I could be a little bit more proactive with conflict 
resolution using myself as an example. All right, we've got just two more here. The second to last here is positive attitude. Having an overall positive attitude. This doesn't mean being a Pollyanna and being cheery all the time, but it's more along the lines of, oh, there's a solution. We can get this done. A can-do attitude, a helpful attitude towards others. That's really what positive attitude is all about. It's not about glossing over. I say this numerous times, because especially when somebody might be in a depressed or real anxious or negative state in their life, they're like, what? I'm just supposed to think positive thoughts and do this and switch moods and just be the happiest person? That's not what I'm saying. Though there is a great benefit to learn how to control our moods, which is absolutely possible. It's a practice because we're conditioned to feel more negatively by society, biology a little bit, but a lot of societal things that go on. So it is a skill set to be able to be a more positive person. And that has to be with taking charge of your own mind and your own emotional state or mood. This is something I had to work on a lot because I'm naturally kind of an enthusiastic person. I've been told I was a positive person when I felt the exact opposite on the inside, right? So I genuinely mean on the inside. Not just fake it till you make it. Sugar over poop, as I like to say sometimes, okay? This is really about on the inside feeling like, no, we can do this, right? And you don't have to be smiling and happy to go, we can do this. Or hey, no, you know, no problem, we're gonna get that done. Whatever. I'm using this in a very work-oriented context. I'm trying to think something that's a little more social and interpersonal in that way. I would say a positive attitude could be having an interest in other people and being kind of tied to openness and kind of like affirming and, and complimentary in a genuine way when I say, like, oh, that's great. You're up to that. If somebody's sharing something that's important about them, being like, oh, wow, that's cool that you're doing that. Like a little bit of emphasis on the fact that you're happy and glad for them. That's another way that positive attitude can manifest. And so let's move on to last but not least, teamwork slash collaboration. Pretty self-explanatory. I love being a teamwork person. I can work very independently, but I also get a lot of pep and zest out of working with a team. Now it's got to be a good team and I've worked with good teams, not good teams and kind of in between teams. But I am a very team oriented person, although a lot of having a coaching business and YouTube channel can be very isolating, though I have plenty of friends out there in, in the world. Still, there's something about at work or in business having a team that you work with. If you have a very isolationist mindset, it's really something you can change if you want to. It's up to you. I'm not saying you absolutely have to change any of these things. Never saying that. But all these things are improvable, absolutely, because our identity is really the sum total of our beliefs. It's a little known hidden secret that shouldn't be so hidden anymore, but we really are an amalgamation of our beliefs and our habits. And a lot of these things can change. Doesn't mean it's easy, but usually if that's something you really want. It's absolutely worthwhile to make those changes. Let me know, drop a comment. Is there any interpersonal communication skill here that you really are interested in learning more about? Or maybe there's one that you're noticing, wow, I'm pretty good at that. But really what I'm curious about if you drop a comment, is there one that you'd like to learn more about that? And if you drop your comments, then I can make more content that's directly specific to what you guys want to hear. It's a form of teamwork, right? To, for us to engage in the comment. Please like this video if you've got something out of it. Uh, subscribe if you're not a subscriber. I want to make sure that you get the latest content if you like what you see here and hit that notification bell and turn it on all the way so you get the newest videos as they come out because I want you to get the stuff that can really help move forward and succeed and be happy in life. So that's it for this video. Coach David here signing off and we're complete. See ya.